All right, well, uh, I'm very pleased to be here as part of your uh, seminar series. I'd like to thank uh, Jackie Gottlieb and the steering committee for um, inviting me to be a part of the series. And I'd uh, really like to thank Nick for both the introduction and for all his help with arranging my schedule to meet with you. So my talk is uh, Tuning Movement to Optimize Information Harvesting and the Transition to Planning. It's a, a kind of a combination of two pieces of work which have been many years in the making and have just come out the last few months. Actually, the planning bit just came out in Nature Communications and the, um, the first part of the talk, which, I, which is on information harvesting, is coming out in eLife in the next day or two, uh, and so we'll be out by the time you see this. All right, so uh, to begin, uh, I wanted to begin somewhat general here and just look at this diagram, the biomass of all kingdoms of life. Here's plants, uh, and here's in this little corner are animals, and a speck uh, in there is, uh, of course, us, whose uh, butts are currently being kicked by this tiny little black part of the Voronoi diagram, the viruses, which is leading us to have to do this virtually, unfortunately. But nonetheless, um, I want to distinguish plants versus animals in terms of their two different approaches to acquisition of energy to generate life. So plants sort of sit around and soak it up, uh, soak up the solar energy, and uh, we're too fidgety for that, and we go around and we get it as animals. Um, and that, uh, that, that sort of central fact of animal existence has lots of consequences in terms of the interchange between information and energy and movement. That is really the focus of this talk. So a lot of times when we think about movement, we think about you know every day kind of going from A to B. Here's an L train that I take to go from my home in Chicago to Evanston um, back before the pandemic started. This is the purple line. Um, but as many of uh, uh, the faculty um, at Columbia spent a lot of time on, of course, sense organs uh, move a lot as well, not just bodies from A to B, but our sensory organs are constantly pivoting around and tuning into things. And this classic image by Yarbis is a, a good placeholder for that. Uh, of course, the whole body gets into the act. Here's a meerkat doing uh, a, a full sort of scan of the horizon using its trunk, neck, and eye movements. And here's a different uh, kind of movement, deployment of movement, which is uh, a leopard using a feature of the habitat, this ravine, to stalk uh, some antelope, unsuspecting antelope, up on the flat area here. So um, I want to sort of span these two areas of use of movement in the talk. So the first part is going to be tuning movement. And by movement here, I'm mostly thinking about sense organs uh, for sensing under uncertainty. Uh, and I point out that very few theories exist that are well specified enough to generate sense organ trajectories. So one question is a normative question. How ought sense organs be moved from an engineering perspective, theory and computation, in weak and noisy or naturalistic conditions. Uh, our theory, which I'll uh, give you more details of, is energy constrained proportional bedding, uh, and it differs greatly from the leading entropy minimization model. Uh, and then a subsequent question after the normative question of how ought was how are uh, sense organs moved, and a lot is known about that, although surprisingly little where we have both a data set in strong signal conditions and in weak signal conditions. And that was really central to the study I'm gonna to present to you. Second part is a strategic use of movement uh, story. Some animals appear to simulate future possibilities and pick one. Of course, that gloss is not uncontroversial and it may yet uh, be proven to be wrong. Uh, but if true, when and why did the selective benefit for evolving this capacity arise? Uh, our theory is, you might call it Buena Vista planning, and you'll see why, uh, is that a combination of the extended visual range uh, possible for animals after coming onto land in the Devonian, coupled to savanna-like habitats, generates a selective benefit for plan-based action selection in, in dynamic and uncertain conditions. So that's a lot coming at you. I'll unpack it later. Uh, so how should sensors move? Well, here's one strategy. 
estimate how much information can be gained by putting your sensory organ at any point in your workspace. Generate a trajectory that at each step leads to an increase in that information, okay? And that algorithm has actually been generated and it's uh, uh, it published in Nature in 2007 by Vergasola et al. And uh, it's, it's gotten a, a good bit of attention. It's essentially an entropy minimization strategy at each step you act to minimize the entropy of the uncertainty or of the, or your belief of um, uh, where the target is. But uh, there's a few issues with infotaxes. One is that uh, if there's no information, as in a flat sort of information field, um, the algorithm can get stuck because uh, movement in one direction doesn't necessarily lead to a decrease in entropy if it's all sort of the same in all directions. So it can stall out. Uh, another is that uh, uh, distractors are, are a problem, real or fictive. By fictive distractor, I mean something like a series of samples that unfortunately starts to look like the thing that you're looking like. And so you go and check it out, but it turns out it's a mirage. Um, so infotaxes can easily get tra trapped into following such a distractor. Uh, so that's another issue with infotaxes. So here on the left, you can see the actual target in the domain. This is a distractor and uh, an infotactic tra trajectory would go straight to the distractor. So uh, energy constrained proportional betting is essentially a situation where we generate trajectories which sample the distribution proportionate to the density, okay? And so the trajectories sample the denser areas quite a bit more than the, the areas with low density, but importantly, they don't ignore the low areas and eventually it'll wa waver, waver out to this uh, true target location and sample that. All right, so that's uh, sort of a quick sort of um, illustration of what goes on with ergodic uh, energy constrained proportional betting. All right, um, a quick sort of historical note is that the work on this algorithm was done to better control an electrosensory robot we developed some years back. It was sort of a whole bunch of work went into the controlling. This is an electrosense robot that works the same way as electric fish that many of you will be familiar from um, Satel's work in your faculty. Uh, and uh, to, to get it to be controlled properly, we developed this algorithm and it worked so well, we sort of said, hey, maybe animals do this. And so we started looking to see if we might test that um, idea. So uh, you've heard of bio-inspired robotics. This is uh, what I'm gonna tell you in this first part of the talk is robo-inspired biology in a sense. All right, so sense organs move a lot while tracking signals. That's a obvious point that needs to be made, but um, across, this is a ubiquitous feature of animals tracking is that they make movements that seemingly move more than somehow necessary, uh, we, we would possibly think. Um, and even, you know, fixational eye movements where you think the eye is completely rock steady, you see all of these microsaccades going on. And this is uh, across all animals, of course. So we're going to focus on electric fish, a data set that uh, we collected in our lab, uh, but we're also we obtain data sets for these other animals and I'll flash those up very quickly just to show you that the agreement's pretty good there too. So the behavior we looked at for electric fish is something called refuge tracking behavior. Uh, to illustrate it, this is a video from Eric Fortune. Uh, this is uh, an electric fish in a plastic tube and Eric is moving the tube side to side and the fish does a remarkable job of staying with the, the two. Uh, the, the idea is that this is a naturally evolved behavior to protect the animal as it hides in vegetation during the day in Amazonian rivers where it hangs out and is active at night. So uh, this is a one dimensional behavior along a line that is easy to bring into the lab and control really precisely as weekly electric fish are, are known to be such great model systems for. Uh, so what we have is we have infrared lights, we have a camera, we have a refuge, and we have a motor not shown here and a linear track that lets us program up any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, trajectory we want. So here's a trajectory actually from Noah Cowan and Eric Fortune's work where they have the lights on. This particular species of electric fish has very good vision 
unlike most. Um, and during the lights on, it tracks near perfectly with the refuge. And then the lights go off and it has to track with electrosense, okay? And notice these body oscillations. So we're gonna just look at these four aft digressions from the refuge. Seems to be a signal or signature of needing to do something different in this poor signal to noise ratio regime where the animal's going from millions of visual sensors to a few thousand electroceptors to guide the behavior. All right, so we do this, uh, but rather than switch off the lights, we wanted to use something a little uh, easier to control in a sense. And that is, for a long time, it's been known that if you feed back an animal's electric organ discharge, but with a frequency offset, it jams their electrosensory system. And so we can dial up the jamming in a very controlled way and look at how behavior changes from no jamming to fully jammed. All right, so here's some data from the lab. Uh, no jamming, just infrared light. Here's with jamming on, you'll notice the four aft body oscillations, time and position. And to quantify this, we're gonna look at something called relative exploration. Where the relative exploration is simply the total distance moved along the path divided by the distance moved by the refuge, okay? And so if the refuge is uh, relative exploration is one, and then the strong signal case, it's a bit uh, beyond one, and then for the weak signal case, it's almost two X. And we can also look for a single trial. We can look at the uh, Fourier magnitude distribution. And this peak here is the refuge's peak at 0.01, or 0.1 hertz, sorry. Um, and the uh, strong signal, um, the strong signal is the green line of the fish's movement and the weak signal is a red line. And you can see larger components in the frequency of movement uh, there for the animal in the weak condition. So we've developed uh, this algorithm originally for the robot that we've modified for the animal work called uh, energy constrained proportional or instantiating energy constrained proportional bedding, which we call ergodic information harvesting. I'll explain why we say ergodic in a bit. Um, let's just jump into the algorithm at the point where we've calculated the simulated fish's belief um, as to where the refuge is, okay? So it believes with the highest probability that the position of the refuge is here. Then from that, it needs to generate an expected information density indicating where, given that belief, it ought to position its sensors to maximally acquire information. Uh, and you get this characteristic bimodal structure uh, because the derivative, uh, where the derivative is maximal along the sides is where the information is maximal for acquiring the signal. I can go into that more in the Q&A if, if that's of interest. Uh, in any case, from this expected information density, we need to generate a trajectory. And this is where some very nice body of mathematics, uh, about 10 years old, comes in to be helpful because we want to generate um, a trajectory that best matches this probability distribution, the expected information distribution. How do you do that? Well, when you think about comparing distributions, you'll think of things like the kolbach liebler um, divergence. But the problem with that measure is that it gives you a way to compare one distribution to another. And here we need to compare a trajectory to a distribution. The ergodic metric lets you do that. And when the ergodic metric is zero, you are maximally uh, proportional, be proportional betting the uh, expected information density. That takes an infinite amount of time, so you're always going to be larger than zero in ergodicity, but the closer to zero you are, the more proportional sampling, proportional betting you are, the more perfect the proportional betting you are doing of this um, distribution. So uh, from uh, now an objective function, which both balances the energy of movement and the ergodicity, we now generate a trajectory segment using optical, optimal control methods. And so that trajectory segment has to sample proportionate to the density of the information. And so it hangs out in these parts where the information is maximal as indicated by the sampling density 
uh, plot showing where more time is being spent uh, by this trajectory segment. Okay, so that's the trajectory synthesis and optimization block. And then it feeds back to an observation model that lets the um, simulation uh, uh, come up with simulated observations. You uh, take the prior belief, you merge it to a posterior to give you the new belief, and you keep going around and around. That is how the algorithm works. Uh, the mathematical details are in the paper. Um, there's lots of nice nuances there, but uh, we don't have time for them. So fundamentally what's going on is a balancing here of information and movement and energy. And the objective function is shown here. It's pretty simple. We have on the left, the ergodicity with a prefactor I don't have time to get into, but it's essentially uh, gives you what the distance. So, so basically zero would perfectly encode the expected information density, but that requires infinite time. And large means the movement does not encode the expected information density. And here, this is uh, uh, this function is the uh, the torques and forces necessary to control the fish squared um, uh, the integral of that uh, for point mass that actually evaluates to the kinetic energy of the system. Uh, so we're basically the objective function is balancing ergodicity or information on one side and energy kinetic energy on the other. So zero is no movement, large is a lot of movement for that term. All right, so let's look at some data. Here's um, our setup again. Here's a, an image from our experiment. Here's some actual data. So I mix simulation and actual data a lot. I'm gonna to try to remember to call out what is real data versus simulation. So they look pretty similar. Uh, so this is real data and this is the fish with a uh, strong signal, meaning there's no jamming, okay? And the fish's trajectory is in green. This is four aft position time. And now we put jamming on and now we get those oscillations I already showed you. Now here's what EIH outputs in these two conditions. Okay, and what we see is that in weak conditions, there's some wiggles, but they're small and, or strong conditions, strong, no jamming. There's weak uh, oscillations, they're small. And in high jamming where the signal's really weak, there's a lot of wiggles and there's these things which I'll call a, called fictive distractors that the simulated fish has to chase down. All right, so what's the basis? So, so what we see across all our data sets is as we weaken the signals, these body oscillations, these sensor organ, sensory organ oscillations increase in their amplitude and they increase in their frequency content, higher magnitude components of their frequency content. So, uh, Energy constrained proportional bet betting as instantiated by our algorithm replicates this because first, higher uncertainty means a more diffuse EID. So ergodicity demands more movement to do proportional betting on this diffuse EID. So bigger traversals of the workspace, this 1D workspace in this case. As signal weaken, there is a higher chance of fictive distractors interrogating these results in digressions, okay? So let me point this out. So here's a simulation, not real data. This is simulated data from EIH. Now we're plotting not the expected information density, but the belief in blue, okay? And these asterisks indicate where the belief has gone multimodal on us. So it's not the, the animals, the simulated animals no longer saying that there's, there's one position of the refuge, but there's a position here, and there's a position here that it thinks is probable. These vertical lines are planning epochs, okay? The trajectory segment is generated at those lines and the EID is not updated until we get to the end, to the next line, okay? So it's kind of in ballistic mode for that segment. So let's look at what happens here. Right here, the uh, simulated animal thinks there is a distractor or thinks that the refuge is over here. So it commands, the algorithm commands, hey, go check out this a possible location of the refuge. So it swings over and gets some more samples. And lo and behold, those samples don't back up that the refuge is there. So at the next epoch, it plans a new trajectory segment swinging back to the uh, correct location, uh, or the at least the believed to be location of the refuge. All right. So that's how those wiggles occur with increased noise in the, in, in, the, in the system, increased or weaker sensory signal. So let's look at um, 
statistics of the data. So this is real data now, relative exploration in strong signal conditions near unity and in the weak signal conditions. And here is a representative sort of uh, spectral decomposition of that. And here's the statistics of the spectral decomposition across all trials. And now we could do the same with EIH, where EIH is fed the same refuge trajectory, but it has no idea. So, so the, the simulated fish has no idea where the actual refuge is, but the algorithm as a whole is fed this refuge trajectory. And then the simulated fish has to estimate based on simulated sensory observations where that trajectory would be, or where that refuge would be. And so with that, we get um, some decent qualitative um, uh, replication of that pattern, okay? Similarly, the spectral decomposition uh, replicates qualitative features of the difference between the low, the, the strong signal and the weak signal, all right? Now, an important question then to ask is, to what extent are these little wiggles that are occurring with sense organs causal of better performance, all right? So we tried to get at that the following way. Uh, here is uh, an approach where what we do is we take the trajectory, the original trajectory of the fish, so, or of the simulated fish, <laughs> Uh, that's this orange one here. And then we apply filters of varying strengths to that trajectory to progressively decrease the wiggles. Then we feed that into the algorithm. So what we do is we cut out the trajectory optimization part and we dictate, we prescribe the trajectory after filtering these wiggles at various levels of attenuation. And then we see what the performance of the system is. Um, and here's what we found. <clears throat> So here is the, so just uh, uh, one point I forgot to mention. So with no filtering, the trajectory is the orange. With some filtering, it's the green. And with the full filtering, the maximal level of filtering, we get this near perfect sinusoid there, okay? All right, so we have on the bottom, the level of attenuation of the wiggles from low to high. And then on the y-axis, we have mean relative tracking error, where 100% uh, error would be moving as much as the refuge displaces. Say it displaces one centimeter back and forth, then 100% would be one centimeter of error. Now, <clears throat> as we go from no attenuation, we get 50% error, meaning half the total refuge displacement to um, near 80% as we increase the attenuation of those wiggles. So, so there's some evidence then that these wiggles are causal of higher performance. We can also use this analysis to look at the energetic cost of movement of information because these wiggles are commanded by the fins of the animal and that takes energy, that takes food. Um, and we, we have developed over decades now very well-tested models of the mechanics of the fish and water. So we can actually quantify how much a particular movement takes, how much energy it takes, uh, or estimate um, uh, computationally. So here's what we have. For strong signals, uh, the uh, relative energy relative to moving perfectly along the trajectory of the refuge is 4x for the strong signals. Because even with the strong signal case, there's a little little digressions. For the weak signal case, it's 16x. In simulation, a whole bunch of trials here, um, the energetic costs are a little higher for the weak signal case. So the relative energy, uh, when we spend 30x relative uh, energy with uh, no attenuation, uh, meaning all the wiggles are present, and then when, as we progressively attenuate, we go over here, to higher and higher levels of relative tracking error. So we see here with this analysis, a way of sort of looking at how these uh, two things are being traded off by the animal, energy and information. All right, so we have additional data sets. Um, we have a mole doing uh, localization of a static odor source. We have a, a, a cockroach 
looking for an odor trail carried by air, and we have a hawk moth uh, trying to feed from the nectary of a flower, a robot flower here. These are all data sets from other investigators listed here. And we've gone, gotten uh, both data for a weak condition and a weak signal condition and a strong signal condition for each of these animals from these investigators. And we've uh, run them, run them th through our algorithm to see how they would do. Here's just the fish data again for sake of comparison. So here's the empirically measured behavior of the mole in strong condition and weak condition and their relative exploration. And here is the EIH generated behavior. And then here is the cockroach uh, actual measurement and then uh, the uh, simulated um, behavior in the bottom row. The, uh, mole, the moth stuff, I can't show you this way because the prescribed trajectories are some of 18 different signs. So it's really complicated and hard to understand. So um, you're gonna have to look at the eLife paper if you're interested in that. But um, basically the sort of that qualitative agreement with empirical data that I showed you before with fish is replicated in these other systems as well. So summary part one. EIH generates good qualitative agreement with measured trajectories in strong and weak conditions. Animals appear to gamble energy for the chance to make an informative observation. And we'd like to suggest that ergodic movement is an embodied component of information processing. This is a sort of, by doing this analysis, we can sort of see how to understand um, the information processing importance of these gambles. All right, so for the second part, I wanna talk about how you tune movement for strategy during predator-prey interactions. So here's a typical underwater aquatic scene. You see uh, a fish, maybe a predator at some short distance, and it's kind of a blur everywhere else because vision underwater is very, very poor. Um, we can sort of schematize what might happen with a prey running into a predator in the following way. Here's our prey. Here's the, the uh, area here is to indicate where the space it's immediately entering into. And slightly larger than that space, at least for vision, is where it's sensing predator. So it's going through space, bang, encounters your predator and tries to flee. All right. So that's the short brutish life of a prey in water. Now, uh, work that we did back in 2017 shown here uh, showed that the uh, visual range increased by over a factor of 100 when we emerged from the water in the late Devonian. And we showed this through analysis of fossil data and a whole bunch of models of vision and uh, in water and in air. And uh, this has some pretty significant consequences potentially for behavior, obviously. Um, so here's one possibility. Let's suppose you've got your prey, again, similar, similar immediate space where you're moving into, your muscles haven't changed dramatically, but your visual space has dramatically expanded. All right. Now, if you can see the predator or think about different possible futures, you can think about these three possible trajectories. And uh, if you happen to see, sense, know, remember the predators over on your left, and then there's this pond you don't want to swim through in the middle, you might pick this one uh, to go through. All right, so that's the idea. But how would one test this? You know, the, this is a challenging idea to test. So there's no way to observe the emergence or elaboration of planning circuits with terrestriality as that was clearly not fossilized, unlike eye orbits, which were fossilized, which was the basis of our PNAS paper. Uh, but so we're gonna do computational modeling of a prey trying to reach a refuge while it's being pursued by a predator. And we're gonna control a whole bunch of factors. One factor is prey, the prey's sensory range. Another is its, is its use of habit-based action selection or plan-based action selection. Uh, and for plan-based action selection, we're gonna control the number of states it can forward simulate in its brain. So basically how far out it can plan. 
and we're going to change the environmental complexity. So there's all these mishmash of things we're changing. It's a complex simulation. So the first experiment we did was compare the survival rate of prey across random pseudo aquatic worlds when behavior is guided by plans versus guided by habit. So the simplified methods are that in an environment with no clutter or obstacles, we vary the visual range and how many steps ahead the prey can plan, all right, if it's planned. The pseudoquatic setup is we have a predetermined visual range, one to five cells ahead. The prey predator can observe the entire environment. The pre prey's aim is to get to the safety position while not getting eaten. Both the predator and prey can move in all directions. The predator is on average 1.5 times faster, which is in the ecological range for speeds of predators relative to prey. Uh, the predator cannot plan and instead aggressively pursues the prey with some randomness. And the prey has a predetermined number of states, as I mentioned before, that it can forward simulate. So here's how we basically model planning. This is uh, built on work by uh, Da and uh, others um, on how to, how to model planning and how to model habit. Um, and so what we've done here is we're essentially growing this inverted bonsai tree in the head of the prey where all possible action sequences are considered in a slightly more intelligent than random way. <laughs> Yeah, we use Monte Carlo tree search, which is a really important algorithm for dealing with Markov uh, decision problems in contemporary AI. Um, so we basically, we let it explore these different possible futures. When there's only 10 states ahead, here's some of the states it can visit. If there's 100 states, here's some of the ways that tree could grow. Every tree is grown in a different way. Uh, and then we do 1,000 and 5,000 is the highest number. And this is based on an algorithm called partially observable Monte Carlo planning by Silver from 2010. Because uh, this is a, a place where you have imperfect information. So it's actually a POMDP, not a MDP. So prey behavior in pseudo aquatic environments, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you two examples, one at low visual range. So here's the, here's the prey trying to get away from the predator it detects with very little advance notice and gets quickly eaten. Uh, with visual range five, we do a little bit better. Uh, one thing to note in both these cases is, uh, and what, what, what we saw emerge over and over again is thigmataxis, which we didn't a priori expect to emerge, but it's a very common behavior that prey do in the presence of pursuit by predators is run to the edge of a space that they're in, whether it's an enclosed space in a lab or even in open spaces, you try to run to like the edge of a boulder or an edge of a shrub or something like that to get away from your predator. All right, so I'm gonna try to explain the way we model habit quickly here. Essentially what we do is we take environment specific success trajectories from the planner, from the algorithm I described below with the inverted bonsai trees. So those result in some successful trials where the prey gets to safety. Uh, and we use that, all those ones that were successful as a seed to this system, which is, so it's basically policies that the prey is going to take take out and execute to the end without sensory feedback, essentially. And so it does these different things from the planner and then uh, it executes the chosen trajectory and then it sees how much reward it gets at the end and then it reweights after execution and puts it back in the policy library and then um, you go on like that. So the policy library essentially matures its, its weight. So the probabilistic choice improves over time of these habits. The important thing is that they're habits, meaning you execute them from start to end without um, sensory feedback as to where the predator has changed its location. All right, so what we see in, these, uh, in this experiment is here's survival rate and number of states forward simulated. So survival rate increases with number of states forward simulated. This is now the planning algorithm. Um, and it improves with visual range, which is a really key point. Um, 
if we look at a heat map of all the places occupied for the successful runs, here's what it looks like, sigma tactic. Uh, and here is the overall data for planning 5,000 states forward simulated for the aquatic domains uh, versus habit, the habit algorithm. And there's no significant difference, meaning that planning in this context cannot beat habit in simple environments. But visual range is not the only important factor, and so that's the second experiment. Here we do a uh, comparison of survival rate across random pseudo-terrestrial worlds when behavior is guided by plans versus guided by habit. And now the simplified methods are we vary environmental clutter, and that's quantified by entropy, no special significance of entropy here other than just a convenient clutter metric. And we also vary planning as we did before. An important thing to note about the occlusions is that they obstruct the line of sight of the predator and of the prey. But the prey otherwise can see as far as it wants because it is now in a terrestrial environment where vision is essentially much, much expanded. So now we, here are the different environments just to show you what they look like as, clutter, as the entropy or clutter level increases. Okay, now I wanna show you some representative behaviors uh, for the pseudo-terrestrial experiment. So here's entropy point one. The behaviors were exactly what we found in the aquatic domain as you might expect. Entropy point five and surrounding entropies, something very interesting happens, which is that occlusions begin to be manipulated by the prey as tools for deception or hiding from the predator. And here you can see that happening here. The prey lures the predator towards this location and dwells in this area for a bit until the predator is in a place where it can sh the prey can shoot out to the side and get to the safety. So these strategic uses of occlusions seem to only occur around uh, mid entropy levels. And then at entropy point eight, um, there's a necking down of possible futures because there's just very few paths through and we, um, we have a decrease in path diversity. I just wanna quickly mention that if you wanna play being a prey in these different environments, I suggest you go to this uh, URL uh, where my lab has developed a game that it can quickly give you a sense of how sort of fast reactive strategies seem to work better in aquatic domains and strategic, you need to be really strategic to survive in the more complicated environment. So give that a, sh a try uh, if, you, if you find this interesting. All right, so survival rate, planning depth, and entropy. So here we have survival rate on the y-axis, entropy on the x-axis, and we get a nice robust peak uh, at around mid-range entropy, showing that planning is really paying off. And it pays off proportionate to how many forward states you simulate. In the low entropy conditions, we essentially get the aquatic results. In the mid uh, entropy conditions, we get a profusion of path diversity because a whole bunch of different paths now are, um, are viable uh, and lead to success, not just the sigma tactic trajectories. And in the high entropy, we again get low path diversity and planning doesn't seem to benefit. Here's the overall data, uh, planning peaks the effect of the survival rate of planning peaks in mid entropy at around 45% survival rate for the parameters of our simulations and hit habit has its uh, has its minima at the very same place. So we want to say that suggests that complex dynamic environments which favor visual tracking generate multiple viable futures and planning allows for the discovery of the diverse set of values, okay? So how do, I'm a very ethologically grounded person. I did most of my initial work on the neurothology of electric fish and, um, you know, grid worlds are not fully satisfying. So how do they relate to real worlds? Well, ecologists uh, use a multi-scale fractal analysis called lacunarity, uh, which quantifies the variability of open areas or lacunae to closed areas, uh, such as biogenic structures, hedges, shrubs, that sort of thing. So we computed the lacunarity of the grid worlds across entropy levels, and we categorized grid worlds into three different realms of lacunarity uh, that landscape ecologists have found typical for aquatic, terrestrial, and complex aquatic, uh, namely coral reef habitats, okay? So that's 
this empirical data is shown here in these different color bars. This blue range is the coastal water range. This green range, green range is what landscape ecologists have found typify land ecosystems and habitats. And this uh, pink area here is the structured aquatic range. So uh, we charted uh, what the lacunarity of our different grid worlds were along uh, these bins, and you can see them here. And essentially, this one zone that we found we're planning it beats habit is precisely in the middle of the land range of the lacunarity realm, which um, was curious. Um, so I started asking, uh, you know, what what are what do those land habitats look like in that middle range? Uh, and I happened to be reading some stuff on the habitats that early hominins are thought to have invaded after splitting off from chimpanzees. A modern analog turns out to be the Okavango Delta. So I just loaded up the Okavango Delta on Google Maps and started computing lacunarity. And lo and behold, here's one of many images I snapped of uh, the Okavango and the binary image that I did the lacunarity analysis on. And it falls straight into this zone, which I found pretty interesting. Um, and here's a, a nicer looking snapshot of what the Okavango looks like. And so you have these, this patchy space where you have these open areas and you have these closed areas, which we think provides maximal traction to, for the selective benefit of planning, potentially, you know, if these simulation results um, uh, hold up. So um, I want to do. I do want to test. There's a large number of theoretical conjectures there. In fact, some more too. And how you ought to switch from planning to habit, in as you switch from different spaces. And that's all in the Nature Communications paper we published um, a couple months ago. So please take a look at that if you're curious. Um, but I don't have time for it here. Uh, but what we're following up with with uh, Dan Dombeck, who several of you I'm sure know. Um, is to test this in rodents. Uh, first, black sixes, but I suspect paramiscus or even grasshopper mice might be necessary uh, for various reasons. But we have a very large maze uh, with magnetic um, reprogramming that we can do, which is now all built and we're about to start running animals in to see how they do with environments of different levels of entropy and different levels of connectedness. And then we're gonna introduce uh, robotic predator uh, to uh, see how they react in these different spaces and see if there might be um, signal there as to uh, our hypotheses. Uh, so do we see evidence for planning as a function of environmental complexity? Uh, does, ev does planning occur at gradients of eigencentrality, which is the stuff I can't tell you about because I don't have time, but is in the paper. Uh, and how do a sort of a pet sort of sci-fi hope of mine is how do we intervene in the mammalian brain to extend uh, the planning horizon, which is clearly a bit, a few, a few sizes too small, at least for Homo sapiens, uh, given current looming existential threats. So I'm very curious about that and how we might actually, from an engineering standpoint, tweak the system for a different planning horizon. Um, so summary part two, the selective advantage of planning increases with range and it's very low at the aquatic ancestral sensory ranges of one to two body lengths where habit performs equally well as planning. Planning is far superior to habit given long range vision on land in combination with the right patchiness of open to closed spaces. And this account may provide insight into selection pressure for visually dominant modern birds, primates and carnivores to evolve planning possibly endothermia and huge brains as well. There's more details on those ideas in the paper as well. Um, and what the deal with stem mammals that are more olfaction, seemingly oriented might be. Um, so uh, more, more details there. Uh, I think the linking part one and part two, um, so there's evidence emerging that in, I love this phrase from, uh, uh, Schultz, uh, that uh, in the retina of the reward system, the dopaminergic system, the brain represents possible future rewards not as a single mean, but as a probability distribution. So this is Davni et al.'s result from a uh, recent Nature paper. 
<clears throat> or computational simulations and some suggestive empirical data at least. And work is also proceeding on the hypothesis that planning involves internalized search, not unlike searching space. Now, energy constrained proportional betting or proportional sampling may help provide a theory for how these probability distributions get sampled with appropriate trading off of the movement effort needed for their execution. So this would be sort of like virtualized EIH. Um, so that's um, some possible linkages between these two very different levels of movement um, command in the system in, our, in, in animals. So I wanna thank uh, the, the key graduate students involved were Chen Chen on the information harvesting part and Orjan Mugan, who's now gonna be a postdoc in David Reddish's lab starting in a few weeks. Um, and she led the planning work. Um, and this is work being done with Dan Dombeck and uh, on the engineering uh, algorithm ergodic harvesting side, Todd Murphy in mechanical engineering here at Northwestern. Uh, and one last thing I wanna leave you with is just as a fun sort of point, uh, now that I've done this work, um, I keep seeing this sort of uh, Savannah-like lacanarity popping up everywhere I look and I was, you know, in the midst of the pandemic, looking for movies to watch with my seven-year-old and we picked, uh, she started getting into Lord of the Rings and we went to The Hobbit and I just saw the, the stuff all over the place where cinematographers, filmmakers seem to know that this, what the right lacanarity for enhancing drama is. So I wanna show you a segment of uh, this movie, The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, where the wizard gets chased by Um, anyway, uh, thought that would be fun to look at. And so I'm going to leave with that. And I'm super looking forward to the Q&A. Um, thanks for your attention. <laughs>